I got to tell you, I was so encouraged this week. Uh, I got a few text messages and our pastoral staff were contacted a few times. But remember when I said last week, we we're talking about treasuring the poor, that my family had a goal of within 30 days, we were going to put together these care packages. And um, there's already been like five to 10 families in the church that have beat us to it. And so we're like, we really set a, a goal too far in the, in the future for this. But got some text messages from people that were creating, you know, cards, having their kids draw pictures, getting a food packet together, and then overcoming the fear to, to hand these out. And it was so sweet to see people living out the sermons. And so that really blessed me to, to see that. If you want to live out the sermon in a different way, I've mentioned that we have a Mexico missions trip coming up where we're going to build a few homes for uh, some single mothers that have come out of abusive situations and their kids. And so we have an interest meeting at 1 p.m. in our next steps room today or all the information's online as well. We've got trips coming up in June and July that we hope you can join us for. So our series today ends of irresistible faith. We've been talking about becoming the kind of Christian that is irresistible to the world in all categories of our life. And so today we're going to talk about a major category of our life, being an irresistible Christian in our work. And I say in our work instead of at our work, because many today are working from home, working remotely, or have the work of, of parenting at home as a stay-at-home mom or dad. And so in our work, the Bible has a lot to say. But check out this recent statistic by a Gallup global poll. 85% of the workforce is disengaged. Disengaged. And so what does that mean? That's a nice technical term. It means worse than you even think. It means that they are viewing their workplace negatively, only doing the bare minimum to make it through the day, and they have little to no emotional attachment. 85% of people are feeling this way about how they are living out their lives at the workforce. And so there, there's lots of different ways to deal with this. And for some people, one article I read said that people are choosing to be serial job hoppers, thinking it can't just be, you know, that all jobs stink. It must just be this job stinks. And then they're finding out they're not satisfied anywhere. And so the recommendation of that article was to really try and get to the root of your dissatisfaction and work on it actively at your current job rather than just hopping from job to job because 85% is a big number. And the statistic isn't 85% of people are disengaged and 15% are Christians. <laughs> That's not the stat there. It's just that most people are disengaged when it comes to how they work. And this isn't just a pandemic problem. This has been going on for thousands of years. 3,000 years ago, here's what King Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes about work. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 22. What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun. All his days of work are pain and grief. Even at night, his mind does not rest. This too is meaningless. A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. This is from the hand of God. People have been struggling to work for, for years. For so many years, people just think, why is this so difficult? Well, the Bible speaks to that difficulty, and we're going to see that today. So I asked my wife this morning as I was driving in, I was like, I should have asked her this earlier, but I said, what do our kids want to be when they, when they grow up? And I know they've told us recently, and so she gave us the latest update. Gideon, as of this morning, wants to be a firefighter because you can sleep there. They have a pole you can slide down, and you can have a dog. <laughs> so it has nothing to do with fires, right? At, at all. I mean, he loves sleepovers. He wants to sleep everywhere but his room. So it's like, it's like a constant sleepover job. That's amazing. They've got a playground built into the firehouse. He's allergic to dogs. So I have no idea why, why he wants a dog, but that he wants to be a firefighter. So look for him fighting fire soon. Abby wants to work at Starbucks because it's a great place and we will get a discount. So at least she's considering her family. I'm like, wait, is there, are there family discounts if you know the barista? And she's committed to this idea. Two Halloweens ago, she was a purrista. Her love of cats and being a barista came together as a purrista. And so she's, she's ready. And, so I, and I hope for that discount. And then Titus says he doesn't want to work so he can stay home with his mom. <laughs> but then he said, well, if I have to, then I'll, I'll, I'll be a construction worker so I can build things. You know, I don't know why that sounds so sweet for a little five-year-old to say he wants to build things. Listen, all of those jobs are going to be difficult for my kids in the future as well. People just struggle when it comes to the workplace. So we have to ask ourselves, is it because our work just isn't meaningful? 
Is it that we are working too many hours and we have a, we have a, we're imbalanced when it comes to life? Or are we not living up to our potential and we need to be doing something different at our job or, or somewhere else? Or because our thinking lacks a biblical-shaped perspective, right? Maybe we need to look at what the scriptures say about this because a change of perspective in why we work can have a huge impact on those far from God that we're working near. And it can lead to satisfaction while we are working ourselves. And so what does a biblically shaped perspective about work look like? Well, there's a few things. The first is work and religion are not separate parts of your life, right? They're, they're the, there's no secular work and sacred religion. And so we've got to get that out of our mind. Colossians 3.17 says this, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks. Whatever we do, no matter what we are doing, we do it in the name of the Lord Jesus and we can be thankful. If you had to guess, this is not rhetorical, so shout out loud when I'm done asking the question. If you had to guess, what is the average amount of hours that someone works over a lifetime? How many tens of thousands of hours? It's going to take a long, we're going to be here forever. If I need someone to boldly shout it out. I wish it was 30,000. I want to know what you do for, a, this is great. 90,000 is the average. 90,000, if you're working from the age of 20 to 65, a 40-hour week job with two weeks off, that's like 92,000. And so if you start work early and work a little later, you're getting close to 100. That's like a third of our life we spend while working. And so if our faith in Jesus is the most significant and meaningful thing in our life, and we spend most of our life working, then we have to connect our faith with our work and it should be a kind of a, a see, an observed thing for other people that our faith works itself out into our life as we are working. But if 85% of people are disengaged at work, and that includes Christians as well, right? if that's the statistic, that's not going to be irresistible for others. If they're watching us thinking negatively about our workplace, they're watching us doing the bare minimum, Right? Then they're going to say, oh, yeah, they're just, they're just like us. There's no difference. But our faith can have a huge impact on our work, just like our work with so many hours can have a huge impact on the quality of our life. So what does our faith have to do with our work? Well, this verse alone, Colossians 3.17, says, whatever we're doing, we should do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so what does it mean to be at your job in the name of the Lord Jesus? How do you represent Jesus where you work in particular? So it's, it's not going to be um, preaching sermons to your colleagues, right? It's not going to, that's just not the faithful. It's not going to be, you know, like, oh, I have to do straight evangelism to my colleagues and then I'm going to get fired because I'm not doing my job. It's going to be something else. How do we represent Jesus? How would Jesus do that job? How does he want us to do that? And how can we have thanksgiving even when work is difficult and things may not be fair there? How do work and faith collide? Well, Everything that we learn from Scripture is applicable at work. Everything. It, it all connects. We have one life that we're living for the Lord. It's not fragmented into faith and, and work as a separate thing. Paul gives us an example of the kind of transformation that happens when someone gives their life to Jesus, how they can change everything about their life. He says in Ephesians 4.28, don't steal. Instead, work. Work. Work that they may, believe, they may have something to share with those in need. So he's talking about people before they knew Jesus being a thief, where they would go and say, I'm going to take from this person so I can selfishly have myself. The transformation they're going through is, now that they are a follower of Jesus, they're going to work. Even if it's mundane, they're going to work. And one of the benefits of that is that they can stop stealing, but they can now give to others that have needs. It's a complete 180. It's a whole different life that we can have with the Lord. And so a biblically shaped perspective shows us that work and religion are not separate parts of our lives, but it's one thing. But also that God is a worker and he created workers in paradise. And so from Genesis 1.1, it just starts out, in the beginning, God created. So God is the inventor of the work week. From day one, when God created, he, he began to work worked six days and he was off one. And so God is the inventor of the work week, but also he created workers while it was still paradise. 
Before sin entered the world, part of God's perfect and good plan was for humankind to work, to, to do something. It's not just enjoy the fruit in the garden. It's to work in the garden. We see this in Genesis 1.26. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish, the birds, the livestock, the wild animals, all the creatures. And in chapter 2, verse 15, he says, let's put them in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And so we were created and we will find satisfaction and meaning in working, even though that's different than vacation, right? Even though that's different than the weekend, right? We will find satisfaction. Part of our, the good thing that God created was us as workers in paradise. So work contributes to our fulfillment as image bearers. It's one of the ways we're made in the image of God is that we can also create and work just like God did. Now, the story of God begins in a garden and ends in a city. I'm not sure if we've ever really thought about that. It starts in a garden and it ends in a city. And so the garden had tremendous potential, but it was all unrealized. And when God's command here can really be seen as take these raw materials and create and develop from it. And so it's a trippy thought to look around at all the, the technology, all the buildings, everything, and recognize it all came from a garden. Everything that we have created has come from this earth, right? God buried some stuff deep underground in caves, all over. But everything that we use is from the garden. It was all there with Adam and Eve, even though they didn't know that they, they weren't going to be involved in inventing any of those modern technologies there. But it was all there. Genesis 128, God says, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth and subdue it. As the human population grew, they were going to continue to develop, subdue, and they were going to work this world to develop something. So our story ends not in a garden, but in a more developed picture. In a city, you could say. Here's the end of the book, Revelation 21. All right, well, this, is, this is heaven. This is, this is the future that is for every believer. John says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Why is starting in a, in a garden and ending in a city important? It implies that this world is still under development. Right? God didn't switch his goal you know, halfway through history, once he saw how creative we were and say, okay, at the end of time, there's going to be a city. Originally, it was going to be another garden, but now it's going to be a city. No, when he created Adam and Eve, he knew what the city would look like. They wouldn't. They would freak out if they knew in that garden, they saw a picture of a city. What's that door? What's a door? What's a window? What is something taller than a hammock in, in a tree? They weren't able to comprehend it. But as humankind developed and we developed cities, God was pleased with that. There are, there are aspects of what we create and build that please the Lord and we're always a part of his plan because it gives him glory, revealing the hidden potential of his creation and his creator's ability. And so if it leaves the world in better shape, then we can celebrate it. We can glorify God in practically every industry. I know some industries we can see as, okay, well that, that industry is just, just wicked. Yes, I'm not talking about some of those industries that are really there to hurt humanity just for a profit. But in most industries, we can glorify the Lord. I love how Scott Sauls shows us all the different industries that can glorify God. So I want to read you this quote. When done rightly, mothers extend the nurture of God. Artists and entrepreneurs, the creativity of God government leaders and business executives, the rule of God, healthcare professionals and counselors, the healing hand of God, educators, the wisdom and knowledge of God, nonprofit workers, the mercy and compassion of God, fashion inventors and stylists, the beauty of God, attorneys and judges, the justice of God, marketers and advertisers, the evangelistic energy of God, authors and storytellers and filmmakers, the drama of God, we can give God glory in every, ish, every industry as Christ's followers. And even God, at the end of his work week, looked around in Genesis 131 and said, this is very good. And there's nothing wrong with having a sense of pride in an accomplishment at, at work, right? We should be working in industries and at jobs that we are, that we are proud of, right? Or, or we can be working in industries that maybe we're not proud of and a job we're not proud of, but... 
we are there to be a witness for Christ in some of those dark places. That's, that's an option as well. I'm glad nobody was around, but I was, I was in the office, and I had a project I wanted to finish by 5 o'clock. I would have stayed till 5.30 if I didn't finish it, but it was just something small. I don't even remember what it was, but I remember I scheduled it for that day, and I was typing out this, this project, and, and it was 4.59 when I hit enter, and I shouted, "Woo!" And thankfully, no one was there because it would have been really confusing to say, oh, it was this boring Excel project I was working on for the church. But I had such a sense of accomplishment because a project was done and the timing worked out well. And there are times where we feel like that throughout the day. I mean, clutter can make us feel really uncomfortable and, and, and anxious. And you, you clean a closet, you clean a drawer, the junk drawer, which uh, statistically you can only clean a junk drawer and it'll stay clean just for two to three days, they say. It's impossible. Uh, beyond that, they say scientifically it's not even possible to clean a junk drawer that, for longer than that. But you just feel good. You know the junk drawer is going to look filthy in a, in a week and there's going to be junk in it. I put the junk in it. I do that. That's my spot where I put all the junk in there. Shannon bought little organizers. It's not going to stop me from <laughs> filling that thing with, can't stop me from filling that with junk. You have to have a junk drawer. But we can be proud and we should be. You know, that same poll said that 59% of the U.S. workforce believe that there are corrupt businesses in our country. Now you think, you think like, oh yeah, that makes sense in this country or that country, but so a majority of our country's employees think, oh yeah, there's a lot of corruption in U.S. business. And that shows that while people may be driven to work for money, they stay at a particular job because they value what they're doing, they value the product, they feel good about it and their contribution. And, and you want to have a sense of pride as you work. And so a biblically shaped perspective shows us that God is a worker and he created workers in paradise, but also, also that all jobs should be respected. But if we want to be satisfied in our work, we have to have a calling as well. We have to be called to a particular job. And then part of the calling could be this job will provide for my family and allow us to do the things the Lord wants us to do. But there needs to be a calling aspect to working. 1 Corinthians 7 says, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. And so we would all say that in Christ, every person has equal significance. But can we also say that every job has equal significance? I think in some ways we can, even though we don't jump to that as quickly. Secular work done rightly is just as much God's work as being a missionary and being a pastor. God's plan for people isn't give your life to Jesus and work vocationally for the church. It's give your life to Jesus and who are your friends that need Jesus, right? And stay in that sphere of influence the Lord has already given you. And each industry can benefit from the irresistible presence of God's followers in that industry. Jesus' earthly vocation shows us this. I think of all the jobs Jesus could have done and he came as a carpenter, came as a teacher, a healer. Right? And it wasn't like a hipster carpenter. Right now it's super popular. You're like, oh man, look at that table, this guy. This back, that's a cool table that lady built. And you're like, wow, man. He wasn't even a cool hipster carpenter. He's just a basic. You ever see those tables where they look like there's an ocean in it somehow? I don't know how you put an ocean in a table. It's all shiny and it's blue and there's wood also. That's amazing. Jesus was just a regular carpenter. And so those that mock some occupations are misguided. Right? We shouldn't look at some occupations and mock them. I remember hearing that in New York City, a sanitation worker makes a hundred grand. You're like, why did I go to college? Why did I a hundred grand? And you know, people are like, oh yeah, and they're mocking that. There's nothing to mock in that. They're laughing at us that they're making a hundred grand there. Or when you hear some people say, as you're getting to know them, oh, what do you what do you do? And they're like, oh, I'm I'm just a stay-at-home mom. You're like, what do you mean just a? I'm just a, the most important thing in my in my child's life, right? What an amazing work to do to be a stay-at-home mom or dad. JFK understood this when he announced that we were going to the moon. He was visiting NASA, taking a tour of the facility, and he stopped the tour because he saw a janitor pushing a broom, and he says, hi, I'm, I'm JFK. I'm sure he didn't use his initials, but I don't want to say his whole name. And he said, what, what's your name and what do you do? And he told him his name, and he says, what do I do? I'm helping send a man to the moon. Right? And so you think, oh, well, yeah, but he's really pushing a broom. No, he understood historically that he was a part of an organization that was sending somebody to the moon. And JFK appreciated that and even quoted that. Every vocation can be a calling from God. 
The, the word vocation comes from the Latin vocare, and it means a call, right? That it's a, that it's a calling. And so how do you find that calling? Sometimes simply you can just ask, where do I find the most joy meeting a deep need, right? Where am, I, where am I most satisfied but also meeting a deep need? That could be my calling. I think I've mentioned this lady before, but I learned something new about her that I want to say. But there was, there was a lady named Asia Brown who's the same age as me. When, when she was 31, she became the youngest mayor of Compton that they've ever had. And she has done such an amazing work in that city. And she feels called by God to be the mayor of Compton. This is a calling of hers. She had every reason to run away from that city. Her own grandmother had a home invasion in Compton that killed her. And yet she stayed in this city and began to work. And one of the first things she did was call a meeting between the Bloods and the Crips, these two gangs, without any police protection. She called them together and just reminded them, you don't want your kids to die. You don't want your friends to die. This isn't working. This isn't working, and we know you don't want these people to die. And she began to use this conflict resolution technique, and crime has dropped 65% from 2013 to 2021 with her doing this. What an amazing thing. I mean, it's what an amazing work that she has done, feeling called by God to do it. She even has a sense of humor. She goes, listen, no, Nobody's going to change their tourism plans and instead of going to Florida, come to Compton to go to an ice cream store. But it's the beginning of change. It's the beginning of our community's transformation. And she believes that and is doing that. In 2018, she felt led to run for the House of Representatives. And so she starts to do that. But then after, I think it was 11 years of her and her husband trying to have a child, all of a sudden she was pregnant. And when she looked at her life, she said, you know, I... For me, I can be the mayor of Compton and a mom, but I don't think I can run and give everything I need to to this office and be a mom. And so she saw her calling as a parent as so important that she decided to drop out of that race and stay the mayor of Compton for a few more years. And I, and I love her priorities that she had. So a biblically shaped perspective on work includes that God is a worker. He created workers. All jobs should be respected, but we need to find satisfaction in them by making sure they're a calling. And finally that we will grow weary in our work and we're going to have to ask for God's grace to help us to be faithful in our jobs. This is probably the one we resonate most with, like, yeah, I am growing weary. But, you know, people with wonderful jobs that we would say, oh, if I could have that job, then everything would be great, find just as much frustration in their lives as those with other jobs. It's the same. Actually, a Monster.com 2021 poll said that 95% of the workforce is considering quitting. <laughs> like, 95%. Now, this really is a pandemic poll, just showing, you know, what's going on. Oh, my goodness. So basically, everyone is thinking about quitting their job. That's how much we're struggling at work. Now, full disclosure, I quit one job in my life. I was in high school, and I was trying to find a job. Where can I practice basketball six hours a day? and still work because I need some money. And so I, I became a newspaper delivery boy for the Asbury Park Press in New Jersey. And I loved it. You worked from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. And that was your job. And then you had the rest. So I would practice basketball from 6.30 to, you know, to noon. I know the math doesn't work. It's five and a half hours, but it was six hours in my mind. And, and it was great. And so I'm doing this job and I, I have a couple weird memories of it. I was in my, my red Ford Thunderbird, Thunderbird and and I was like, this is, you need music to be a delivery boy. And so I went and bought, uh, I don't know if it's a CD or cassette, to be honest, but it was the band Sixpence None the Richer, the song Kiss Me. So I'm like, kiss me. Just thinking, like, it was weird. It's weird. It's weird that that was my song. That was my jam. So now, like, whenever I open the newspaper, I'm like, kiss me. And Shannon comes over and gives me a kiss. And it's a, it's a weird memory that I have there. But I enjoyed it. It was kind of fun. It was peaceful and quiet. Well, then all of a sudden, one day I wake up and I feel so good because it's 8 a.m. And I forgot to go to work that morning. And I'm thinking, oh, no, they're going to hate me. People have a rhythm of reading the papers before they go to work, and they're all going to hate me. And the Asbury Park Press is going to go under. And so I didn't know what to do because I was a kid, so I just never went back to work. <laughs> and I never picked up the phone. They're like, are you okay? Voicemail after voicemail. Are you okay? We just want to make sure you're okay. And I'm like, I can't talk to them. This is too much stress, right? They're all going to hate me. And so after a few months, they stopped calling, and I got a check just for the, 
like less than two weeks I worked with so much money that I hated myself for quitting that job. Now, I just want you to know that I've been late to work twice so far since I've been working at Cornerstone and I haven't quit, so I'm staying, I'm staying around. But, but man, the main reason for people quitting their jobs is burnout. They're just feeling too overwhelmed, exhausted, and they feel burned out in their position. And of course, the Bible speaks to this, but we fail at work. We make mistakes at work. We lack skill. We lack motivation. We lack capacity to produce the kind of work that will satisfy us. Why? Well, the Bible speaks to this in Genesis chapter 3. After Adam and Eve sinned, here's what happened to the paradise. It says, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles, and by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food. Ouch! Sometimes you read that, and your first thought is like, is this an overreaction of of God? Like, is this, you know, this is a lot of consequence. Well, let's stop focusing on that and recognize our own sin has a lot of consequence, doesn't it? Forget about Adam and Eve. We wouldn't have done any better. They were our best chance. Our own sin today has so much consequence. We cause so much pain in the people that we love. And the Bible gives us a clear example of why there's this frustration, but what God is doing as we feel frustrated working in this, in this curse. The Bible paints a picture of someone who at the end of their life, you'd, you'd think they're, they're just a failure. They haven't done anything. And that's Jesus. That's what, you would, that's what you would think if you were in that town looking at what happened on the crucifixion. Jesus spent three years pouring into 12 people and Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him and the rest abandoned him. And that's, that's what he accomplished, or so it seemed. But God was working behind the scenes on the cross to actually give us the greatest victory over sin, over our frustration, over death, that victory that happened at the crucifixion. God is working behind the scenes in our lives as well. And so as we struggle at work and we have that choice, am I going to be disengaged? Am I going to do the bare minimum, whine and complain and think negatively about everything? Am I going to do that like everyone else is doing? Or am I going to ask God to help me to be faithful, even though this is difficult, mundane, and I'm just not enjoying it? Maybe my overseers aren't treating me the right way. Am I going to ask God to help me have solid integrity and character? And in those moments that we choose, yes, God, give me the integrity, even though no one would know otherwise. We are becoming a person that has more integrity that will affect every relationship that we care about, even outside of work. The struggle at work gives us an opportunity to glorify God. As other people see us mistreated at work and they know we're in an unfair situation, we've been passed up for promotion or whatever it is, when they see us react in a godly and gracious way, it will give God glory to say, what in the world? And as we can explain to them, to be honest, I have so much satisfaction and joy in the Lord that, yeah, this is wrong. Yeah, I'm actually still going to talk to HR about it. I'm going to make sure that my rights are are handled the right way. That's fine. But I'm going to do it with a gentle and loving spirit because God has been so good to me, even though this person's been wrong to me. And so I can extend God's forgiveness that came to me to other people. Well, that's a different kind of reaction that is irresistible to those that see it. If we were able to see how our work connected to God's greater plan and greater witness, we would ask him for faithfulness to do the job well. In fact, that's what Philippians 4.13 really is all about. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We think it's really designed because God knew that eventually there'd be Christian high schools that need a sports slogan. And so I got to put something on the back of the you know, shirt. So I'll have Paul say this, and it really is just for sports teams to win, right? We think that's the context. Every school does it. But really, Paul is talking about discontentment. He's saying, oh, boy, do I need God's help. I'm not content. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, even be content when I'm doing this thing that's difficult to do, and I want to do everything else besides that. That's what that verse is there for. So because Jesus worked tirelessly for our redemption, we can exhaust ourselves for the redemption of others. We can respond differently at work, in our work, than others do. We don't have to be that 85%. We can be the 15%, not because we have the best jobs, but because God is changing our heart. And we can pray that God would use our contribution to help others, like Matthew 5, 16 says, to help others see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Wouldn't that be such an amazing result of being in a difficult job 
having a difficult season at work is if people saw us, saw how we responded, and somehow it drew them to the Lord and it gave God glory. That, that, would, that would make it all worthwhile. But God needs to give us the strength for this because we're kind of stuck in that 85%. And yet God will give us the grace. God will help us. And we're going to fail. And we're going to fail publicly in front of other people. And we'll have a chance to apologize, to, conf- to confess our sins, and to move forward in a way that is equally as surprising as not failing. Right? So let's ask God for strength to do that. Father, that's not easy for us to do. People are frustrating, (laughs) and work can be frustrating and exhausting, and yet you've called us to live a sacred life entirely, even even at a secular job. Lord, we we don't want to minimize any job and lift one job up over another. Life really is about faithfulness. We want to be faithful in all of our pursuits, and so with one-third of our life in the workplace, Lord, we know that you care about that part of our lives. And so, Lord, you may be speaking to each person in this room a a different point of truth or something to live out in their lives. Help us to be faithful, Lord. Help us to ask you for the help that we need. Help us to guard our attitudes and our behaviors, to find such satisfaction in you before we go to work in in our morning devotions that we can get through the most difficult days with you by our side. So help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, guys, today, if you've been reading the Irresistible Faith book, That at my house at 2 p.m. we're having coffee and snacks to go over that. But if you've just been here for this sermon series and you want to talk about this sermon series today at my house at 2 o'clock, you are invited to come and do that as well. And we'll see you next week at our 30th anniversary. See you later. Bye.